large network aggregator of beacon and proximity data. It takes attribution to a completely different level where it gives a lot more security back to the advertisers to really understand did my marketing spend result in a people visited my store. So you get that data from people that search on sports, people that read sports, but it's a completely different thing to read sports and watch sports. Advertising is, it's all about scale. And for an advertiser to reach 15,000 users, that's not really that uh, interesting. They need to reach hundreds of thousands, millions of the user in order for the ad spend to be efficient. If you are a proximity company out there, and kind of my message is to say you are sitting on gold, like you have so much valuable data that you are probably not uh, using, you not using for the for the benefit of your clients, and there's probably a way to monetize it. And equally, if if your advertiser or brands, you should really get your eyes up for proximity data and the value and what you can do 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 with it. You're listening to the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Beaker System with Steve Statler. Welcome to the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Beaker System. My name's Steve Statler of Statler Consulting. This week we have Thomas Waller, the CEO of Unicast, with us. And Unicast is the company that underwrites Proxbook, the directory and the quarterly report that we do this show in partnership with. So Thomas, welcome to the show. Thanks, Dave. Great to be on. It's very cool to have you on. The topic for this week is Beacon Ad Networks, and we cover this subject in our book, Beacon Technologies, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Beaker System. And now we're going to be talking to you about it. There's a lot of jargon that surrounds this area. And what I'm hoping we can do in our conversation is to cover three areas. One is to do some jargon busting. And for those people who aren't familiar with the ad business, just to spell some of the myths, explain some of the jargon, get people comfortable with that. Um, and then secondly, we want to ask the question, who is Unicast? What do you do? How do you do it? And then topic three, let's talk about the market. Let's talk about uh, proximity solution providers, how they can make money uh, working in this area. So sound okay? That sounds like you do, plan. Fantastic. Uh, so before we get into the jargon busting, just give us a quick elevator pitch on who Unicast are and what you do. Yeah, so Unicast, we're a company based in New York and in Oslo, and we are uh, the world's largest network and aggregator of beacon and proximity data, which means that we have built uh, a network of now more than 65 beacon and proximity companies. They all sit on very valuable data, very interesting data where people spend their time uh, in the offline world. The challenge though is that this data is uh, fragmented, it doesn't have, have scale. So we have built this platform, Unicast Prox, where we aggregate data from multiple uh, companies and we normalize it, we standardize it, and then we uh, allow retailers and brands and advertisers to use this data currently for their uh, own advertising um, st strategies. So they use this to retarget people that have been to specific stores. They use this to do uh, attribution, which means that if someone has been displayed an ad, you can see if that ad also uh, made that customer walk back to the, to the store. So very much kind of solving the complexity and the fragmentation in the beacon space where there's so many great, great companies, uh, but they all collect data in different ways. And the advertising industry is looking for one pipe into the world of proximity data, and that's that's what we are solving. So that's a great summary, uh, and there's a lot there that we're going to unpack over the next half an hour or so. You used a couple of buzzwords. One of them you explained a little bit, which was attribution. Just go to the next level. You talked about attribution as seeing if someone responded to an ad, and in this case, presumably you were advertising a venue of some kind, and we can see if someone went there using beacons. What are traditionally the problems with attribution and what do beacons do to help solve those problems? Sure, so if you kind of look a bit at the history, Steve, you see that previously advertisers really didn't care about uh, measuring the effect of their ad spend. But they were very focused on click-through, right? Did people click on the ad? And then advertisers became more sophisticated, so they wanted to know, if I display this ad for Subway, did this ad also result in that people went back to my subway restaurant? 
And the data set the last couple of years that have been used for this is uh, GeoData, like uh, lat long, which can be collected from apps or from uh, the app exchanges, the, the services that provide, uh, provide the ads. But the challenge here has been that the accuracy, because if you have a lat and long, and you know this when you use your GPS on your phone, right? It's not always precise. So you might be on the right side of the street, you might be on the left side of the street, in dense cities, uh, you can only kind of see that you are within a certain uh, quarter. So what the proximity technology and what the beacon technology is so unique is that with this technology, we can with 100% certainty know if the customer visited that specific store. Because they interacted with that specific beacon, it's hardware de deployed, so it's 100% deterministic data. In addition, if beacons are placed in different departments, let's say the shoe department, Department of a uh, uh, store, then we can also know if they went into that uh, shoe, shoe department. So it takes it takes attribution to a completely different level where it gives a lot more security back to the advertisers to really understand did my marketing spend result in a people visited my store. Okay, there's a parallel there, and obviously what you're really interested in is conversions and acquisition and. We've taken that from the web, web world, we've applied it to the physical world. You use this term retargeting in your introduction. Explain to us what retargeting is. Yeah, so retargeting means in short that an advertiser or a brand is advertising to consumers based on their past behavior. That could either be that you have uh, searched a website, you've been on um, H&M.com, and now you're being retargeted the next day, the next few days, based on your online behavior. I think all of, the, all of you kind of watching this have probably experienced that, that before, that you see ads following you based on your online uh, behavior. But that hasn't been really uh, the fact based on our physical offline behavior. So when I talk about retargeting, I mean how advertisers can retarget a consumer that have visited a specific store. So if you've been to the shoe department at H&M, if you've been to the Yankee Stadium, now these two brands can say, I'd like to advertise to these people that have been in my physical location. Like there's a much higher likelihood for them to react positively to that ad than someone that hasn't. And the way that advertisers have approached this in large today is that they have bought what we call segments. So let's say that you are a um, football stadium. You want to advertise for season tickets. So you try to advertise to people that are interested in sports. So you get that data from people that search on sports, people that read sports, but it's a completely different thing to read sports and watch sports. So with all these stadiums now that have deployed beacons, with the use of this data, they're not able to see, to, to say, I'd like to advertise to people that have been to my stadium. So there's a much higher likelihood of that ad having a positive effect uh, and actually being relevant for that specific user when you use something as accurate as Beacon Data. I'm very conscious of retargeting because I search a lot on Beacon subjects and I find that I'm seeing a lot of adverts for our book, Beacon Technologies. KJ and I worked on the Beacon Networks chapter together. But here's the thing, Steve, is that Yes, we all are being retargeted daily based on our online behavior, but still, we spend 70% of our awake time in the offline space. So the reason why a lot of consumers are kind of feel retargeting as a pain in the ass is that it only reflects a fraction of what we do when we are awake. And of course, we can't have an internet economy without ads. Like that's the it's the fuel of the free internet economy, but what we can do is make sure that those ads that are displayed to users are even more relevant. And for them to be more relevant, we have to understand that user in a much, much broader scale than just those 15 minutes, 25 minutes that we sit in front of our computer booking a holiday or searching for a new uh, barbecue uh, for the porch. Right. So if there was more retargeting based on my physical movements, because I'm more than just someone who's into beacons, I'm also into DIY, I visit places like Home Depot, I like certain kinds of food. Um, adding that physical component could enrich my profile and mean that the ads are better targeted. 
Let's do some more jargon busting and then um, we'll move on. Programmatic advertising. What is programmatic advertising? So this is also kind of how the whole advertising space as a developer. Of course, in the early days, you had to call a guy and say, hey, I want to buy X number of ads. And then um, someone maybe bought the front page of uh, Financial Time. So the same ad was sent to millions of people. So you didn't really care who you were uh, reaching. You just wanted to place as many ads out there as possible. Programmatic advertising is something that's come in the last uh, couple of years, which is very much about being smart in terms of how you spend your uh, advertising dollars, which means that everything is based on uh, automation. Everything is based on audience, which means that you as an advertiser can say, I'd like to advertise to people within a certain segment. So that could be people that go to sports stadiums, people that travel frequently, people that go to pet stores. And without going into detail, this whole ad tech ecosystem are able to, based on that request, make sure that your ad is only exposed to people that fit into that specific uh, cat category. And it all happens automatically. There's less people being uh, involved, which means that this whole advertising industry is becoming way more uh, data-driven. And in order to have a well-functioning programmatic space, data is key. Data is key to reach your specific users. So to the extent that we're moving from rather clumsy manual advertising to programmatic advertising, the fact that we have beacons and beacons give rich, accurate data, these two things are tightly linked and they go well together. What's a demand side platform and what's a supply side platform? Yeah, so a demand side platform that is, in short, it's a system uh, that allows kind of buyers of ads to reach uh, multiple ad exchanges. So able to reach multiple different places where they can place their, their ads. So instead of uh, USD, one of the uh, advertisers for Stafford, Stafford Consulting, you have to call up a lot of different uh, publishers where you want to place your ads. Let's say it's the Financial Times, it's the Wall Street Journal, and it's a lot of other websites. You go to one DSP, and they'll make, make sure that your ads will be distributed across a wide range of uh, inventory, as it's called, to reach your specific beacon, beacon paths. So it's a way of just doing advertising way more efficient. And what is inventory? So inventory is... Uh, the ads that you have available, that the publisher has available to display to their users. Mm -hmm. So when you go on their website and you see uh, there are different ads on left side, right side, on top, that's the inventory. So if you have three ads on their page, then you have three different in in inventory elements that the publisher can sell and where advertisers can put their ads. And what does the supply side platform do? Yeah, so the supply side work for the sellers of advertising. Mm -hmm. So what that does is that it makes it very easy for uh, a publisher to manage their inventory space. So they put all their inventory, all the available uh, ad placements that they have available on the supply side pl uh, platform. And then this supply side platform will ensure that these specific inventory places will be bought. So it's a way of, again, making it more efficient on the sell side so that uh, you make sure that your inventory, that the ads that you have available, uh, can be bought uh, frequently. So if I'm the New York Times, I would have a supply side platform that would allow me to interface with a number of different exchanges and maybe manage private side deals too. If I'm Procter & Gamble, I'm going to be using a demand side platform to figure out how I'm going to best drive conversions and work across multiple exchanges. Presumably exchanges are where all this bidding occurs. Anything else we should say about exchanges? No, I think that's pretty spot on. It's, uh, it's, it's a very sophisticated uh, technology platform that uh, facilitates kind of buying and selling of media uh, in a very efficient way. And it's usually kind of based on a bidding system. So let's take an example. Uh, you have Joe. Joe is a sports, sports fan. And then you see that he uh, he shows up on the side. Then you have two different ad advertisers bidding for that specific uh, person. 
and they're both going to fight for displaying their specific ad to them. Okay, last bit of jargon, DMP, what is a DMP? Yeah, so a DMP is uh, one of those terms where it focuses on facilitating the whole ad ecosystem with a lot of data. So DMP stands for Data Management uh, Platform, mm -hmm. and it allows you as advertisers to create the target audience uh, based on a combination of a lot of different uh, parameters. So you could say, I like to use DMP, I like to reach people that are 18 to 35, interested in sports, and lives in New York. And then you use that data combined with your DSP to actually make those bids and place those, those ads. How do beacons fit in with this? Uh, beacons give us accurate data, they can help enrich the profiles of people modeled in a DMP, they can help trigger adverts, they can enable, enable retargeting. Are any of these things being done now? Uh, and are DMPs being enabled? Do they have fields in them now that are being populated by beacons? Let's give some examples. So Blue Kai, owned by Oracle, that's a DMP, right? But specifically, what I'm interested in is, are these DMPs, do they now have fields in them that are being populated with, with beacons? Because like, let's give some examples. Um, so Blue Kai, uh, owned by Oracle, that's a DMP, right? That's correct, yeah. Is their DMP beacon aware yet? Do you uh, know? Yeah, like that one, and another one that we work very closely, which is uh, Lodemy. So both of those have beacon data available, uh, which means that if you as an advertiser want to reach that very specific uh, audience and you want to use deterministic data, mm -hmm. then uh, beacon data is available there. Very cool. But a lot, uh, a lot of the complexity here has been about scale, right? Because imagine when you have, and according to Proxbook, uh, which is a beacon directory that we, uh, we uh, host, there's more than 350 different proximity companies, right? So they all collect data in different ways, and not all of them have scale individually to kind of get to a certain data level that advertisers want to buy. So, and for a, from a DMP perspective, it's very challenging and complex for them to integrate with multiple different proximity companies. So that is kind of the essence of Unicast and what, what we are solving for the whole marketplace is to make sure that if you're a proximity company and you want to use or sell your proximity data, you don't have to in, in, integrate with the hundreds of different ad tech platforms out there. And if you're a DP or a DSP or a data exchange, you, you don't have to integrate with hundreds of different proximity companies. Both parties can plug into Unicast and both sell the data at scale and get access to data at scale. Okay, so you're providing a gateway to the DMPs. Yes, correct, because Advertising is, it's all about scale. Kind of for ad advertisers to reach 15,000 users, that's not really that uh, interesting. They need to reach hundreds of thousands, millions of the users in order for the ad spend to be efficient. So that is why we are helping now 65% of the companies where we aggregate the data into the Unicast platform and then we reach a certain level of volume and that is when advertisers uh, get in, gets interested and buys this, this data. I think you've implicitly answered this question, but let's really nail it. If I'm a beacon technology company, uh, you call them PSPs, right? Yeah. So I've started up my company, I've got my seed funding, my business plan, I say 50-50 chance that part of that business plan is gonna be based on the value of the data or ad dollars I could generate. I'm starting to think of myself as a location advertising company and I look at Unicast and I say, hey, that's what you guys do too. You guys are the competition, right? How do you have the conversation with a beacon company that has decided they're going to make money from advertising and they look at you a bit suspiciously? Yeah, so I think this word goes much to kind of what's, what, what the core business of every, uh, every company, right? We, we are, Unicast is a neutral company. We are, as we call us, the Switzerland between uh, the proximity ecosystem and the advertising e ecosystem. So the approach that, that we have to our, our proximity partners is that one, you might have very valuable proximity data, beacon data on your platform, but you might not have the knowledge or expertise or the capacity 
to plug and sell this data into the complex advertising space. So if that is the case, uh, Unicast can help you to monetize that data. We will onboard all your data. You don't have to care about your data structure. We will harmonize it on our side to ensure that we reach kind of a structure where the advertisers and the ad tech platforms want to buy this, this data. So that's, kind of, that's number one. Number two is that uh, for the proximity companies, they most likely, I would say in 99% of the cases, they have clients that already are spending a lot of money on advertising. So if you have a retailer that have bought your proximity solution and they are spending hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars on advertising today, but they're not using this very valuable first-party proximity data. So what Unicast can help with is to onboard that data it's a uh, lock, it's in a silo, to the advertising platform of your uh, desired client. So that retailer that is spending money on advertising uh, today, trying to reach their own customers, with the help of Unicast, they can now get access to their own, own users through their uh, desired advertising platform. That makes sense. So you have the links into the ad companies, you have expertise, with the Switzerland thing, you, you captured it very well with that metaphor. You said it's all about scale, and so even the largest beacon providers, a, a contact IO, tier one, they need to work with others to achieve scale. And for them on their own, it's going to be hard to work with an Estimote or a Gimbal, but they can do that through you guys, right? Correct. And, and I think even though there are some great proximity companies out there, beacon companies today that have large, large volumes, they they still come to Unicast because our expertise uh, lies in how to understand how to interpret and structure proximity beacon data and how to make that data available and sold on the different advertising platforms as efficient as possible. We don't deploy beacons. We don't work with retailers and clients uh, ourselves. So there is no kind of competition there between us and our, our proximity uh, partners. We just make sure that we can create the efficient marketplace and e ecosystem that allows this super valuable proximity data to make its way into the advertising space. So what is it that's difficult about what you do? It sounds like a great business. You're right in the middle of this incredible ecosystem. What makes doing what you're doing hard? I would say there's, there's two things. It's um, complexity, right? So we work with multiple set of uh, proximity partners that all collect data in different ways. A lot of our IP, a lot of our knowledge lies in streamlining and harmonizing all this, this data. Because that's what the advertising platforms are requiring. They only want one data structure that makes sense to them. They can't manage tons of different data, data structures. So a lot of our teams are hardcore engineers, data scientists that just gonna kind of live and breathe data every single day, trying to figure out what is the best way to make a usable value out of all the proximity data that we uh, get access to. And the second part is, of course, about education. We all know, and we've been in this space for some years together, Steve, that uh, Beacons, proximity is still new. Uh, there's still some education that needs to be done both towards the proximity companies, like what, how can they use this beacon data for advertising? Why does this make total sense for their uh, customers? But equally also on the advertising side, kind of why should the advertiser use proximity data compared to other data sets? But again, that, that is the role that we have taken in this ecosystem to ensure that the proximity companies, the beacon companies, they should focus on what they are best on. And that is to deploy great technology, build amazing user experiences with a very sophisticated software, and then Unicast take care, takes care of the data management, the data processing, and how this data is utilized to the advertisers. Where have we got to in the development of the ecosystem? Using Jeffrey Moore's model, are we about to cross the chasm? Are we between early adopters and the early majority? I think we are definitely about to cross the, the chasm and I think what, what we have seen, and we of course follow this market uh, very, very closely as uh, everyone else. Uh, we also have, which I mentioned, the directory of proxbook.com, which is a directory with 350 different proximity companies. They have all listed their profile, created use cases, 
listed technologies, uh, kind of really what they do. And based on all that data that we get from all these proximity companies, one of the things that we have seen in the last two quarters is that where beacons and proximity initially was all about push messages, it was about sending the right message to the right consumer at the right time. That's still very important for the proximity e e ecosystem. But we also see now there's a shift now and where there's a more, more use of beacon data in analytics, more use of beacon data in online advertising, and more use of beacon data in data monetization. So the, I, I think personally that we are still just kind of seeing the tip of the iceberg in what proximity data actually can, can do. It started off with push notifications and uh, proximity marketing, but I believe that we will see the next year, the next eight, eight months, uh, a continuous shift into other ways that it, this data can be utilized. And we just want to make sure that we can help all these proximity companies to uh, get on that uh, track and make sure that they can uh, utilize this data the best way. And so how long do you think it is before when the fat part of the adoption curve, how long will it be before this thing is going gangbusters? I wish I could uh, say that super confidently, but I think based on the recent development that we, we have seen now, Proxy Report Q3 is coming out in a couple of weeks, like still kind of great numbers we see from, uh, from the space, I believe within a year or two, that is when we see that uh, retail and brands are deploying beacons at scale. And we see some great signs uh, from now already from our 65 proximity companies. So uh, I'm, I'm very optimistic about uh, how beacons and how proximity technology will evolve the next uh, 12, 18 months. Very good. Any last things you want to cover before we sign off? No, I think you kind of covered this uh, pretty, pretty well. I think if you, are, um, if you are a proximity company out there and kind of my message is to say, you are sitting on gold, like you have so much valuable data that you are probably not uh, using, you not using for the for the benefit of your clients, and there's probably a way to monetize it. And equally, if if you're advertiser or brands, you should really get your eyes up for proximity data and the value and what you can do 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 with it. Viewers and listeners can learn even more about who is doing what in this space from our book Beacon Technologies, available from Amazon. Thomas Waller, CEO of Unicast, thanks very much for coming on the show. Thanks a lot, Steve. Where did you work before Unicast? Yeah, so uh, me and my uh, like KJ, my co-founder, we both worked at uh, Tidal, the music streaming service, and we were part of the panel team at Tidal. From the early days when uh, piracy was a uh, pain in the ass and the record label didn't know how to make money of, uh, of music and that's when we started Tidal and uh, had an amazing journey building the whole music uh, streaming ecosystem and then eventually the rapper, the well-known rapper JC ended up buying uh, the music service at the end. Well, that's a pretty good exit. Sometimes I ask you if you're interested in music and for instance the CEO of Estimo He's not into music at all. He's a visual person, and I'm assuming you're into music. So which three tracks would you take to Mars if for some bizarre reason you were going there and you could only take three? So I actually have only two tracks that okay. really mean something to me. Okay. Uh, and even though I work at a music company, I, I'm not a huge music person. Kind of, I'm not a very sophisticated mer uh, music person. Like I listen to the radio. I listened to the top top 20, 20 tracks. People bullied me the whole time because I was so so commercial in my music taste. Yeah. There's two tracks in my life that are kind of uh, that I really enjoy. That is, uh, when I was young, I, Oasis was my number one band. Like Wonder Wall is still one of my favorite songs. Yeah. Uh, so it it just kind of recalls so many good memories from my uh, youth. Uh -huh. And the second one I would say is uh, Jay Z. Empire State of Mind, not because um, I've I always been a music fan of Jay-Z, but it also reminds me very much about the time at Tidal. And, uh, we built a service, we listened to Jay-Z every single day. I actually had a quote from Jay-Z on my uh, business card, uh -huh. and three years later, Jay-Z ended up buying the music service. That's cool, very cool. Must have been a lot of fun. 
Were there any takeaways from that music industry experience that informed what you've done in founding Unicast? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, one of the things that both uh, Kate and I enjoy very much is to solve complex uh, ecosystems. And very similar to what we are doing now in the proximity space, which I will talk uh, a bit about, same thing with the music space. We managed to get all these different labels, multiple different record labels, right holders, artists, to join one platform, one music platform, giving end users easy access to all the music in the world. So kind of the same learnings that we have from Tidal, how to make two very complex ecosystem play into the ones. It's, it's, it's sort of that uh, experience that we are now uh, using and uh, taking into account in Unicast as well. Yeah, that's, that's a great parallel there. And I think it, if you were looking for something even more complex than the music industry, you found it. So not likely to be bored. Okay, thanks very much for that.